Well, namaste everybody once again. Today we are going to talk about NAC. We all are acquainted with NAC, National Assessment and Accreditation Council. And since we all are involved in activities of value education, so it was thought that why not have a look at NAC and how it promotes as well as it includes and also it encourages the institutions to include inputs in human values in education. So we are going to talk about this today. And a good thing to see here is that the accreditation bodies or the affiliating bodies, if you look at their intention or their vision, to a large extent, we can see that efforts have been made to make the education value-based. And this is something worth considering when we are going for implementation of such programs in our institution. And today, <clears throat> there is also some kind of uh, pressure, I'll say, from the government that the institutions have to go for such accreditation. A lot of encouragement is being also given to the colleges so that they move ahead and go for this. So why not have a look at NAC from this perspective? How does it include human values? And if you work for promoting human values in the institutions, does it help the colleges who get good points, good credits in NAC? So do we find this kind of discussion worth discussing, worth uh, sharing yes, here sir. on this platform? Yes, sir. It's really very relevant and uh, very timely also because most of the colleges and universities are going for NAC accreditation. G, G. So that's why it was thought that why not have a session on this in our monthly meeting. So if you look at the core values of NAC, it clearly states five core values. And uh, the first value is contributing to national development. The second one is fostering global competencies among students. Third one is inculcating a value system among students. Fourth is promoting the use of technology. And fifth is quest for excellence. So we can see that the third value that it stresses upon clearly promotes uh, having a value-based education, inculcating values in the students. And uh, if we put this at the core, then we can see that the other four values are also closely associated with this. So when we say that the education has to contribute to national development, so we essentially have to understand what development means. And then only we can contribute to national development, isn't it? When we talk about global competencies, so we have to understand the meaning of competence. What exactly competence is? Is it only imparting skills or also developing the right understanding? And what kind of competency would be acceptable globally? What can be universal? That is also to be understood. Now, when you go to promote the use of technology, so how do we make out whether it is use or misuse? For that also, an understanding of human values is necessary. And finally, if you look at the quest for excellence, so again, excellence, as we say, is right understanding and right feeling. And how can the students be encouraged to go for lifelong learning in this direction? So if you look at all these five competencies, they boil down to ensuring values in the system among the students, among the faculty, the staff, the management, isn't it? So we can see that this is the foundation of securing a kind of good position, or I'll say that excelling in terms of the criteria set by NAC. And clearly, we can see that point number three uh, clearly indicates that we have to work for inculcating a value system among students, isn't it? So from the very beginning, we can see that the way the whole thing has been designed, it is trying to promote human values, isn't it? If you look at the quality indicators, so there is a quality indicator framework, QIF, and there are seven criteria set there. The first criterion is curricular aspects. The second criterion is teaching, learning, and evaluation. The third one is research, innovations, and extension. Fourth criterion is infrastructure and learning resources. Fifth criterion is student support and progression. Sixth criterion is governance, leadership, and management. And the seventh criterion is institutional values and best practices. If you look at criterion seven, it is totally in terms of human values. When we talk about the values and the best practices. 
so not only some giving like giving some inputs in the classroom but also take it to leaving we'll see how the criteria have been designed there are three sub criteria under criterion 7 and how they address the human values and how they promote the implementation of values in our work in our behavior in our celebrations so uh, i have highlighted criterion 1 2 3 and 6 in blue and these are closely related to inputs in human values if you look at the criterion 4 and 5 they are somewhat related but somewhat distantly related not so closely related and criterion 7 is totally in terms of inculcating human values so you can see that here again out of seven five criteria are directly or indirectly related to human values yeah there are some comments here so i'm just going through them nice so if there's any question please uh, ask me to pause and then raise your hand and i will respond to your questions now, if you look at the distribution of metrics and KIs across the criteria, KIs are the key indicators. So, all the colleges, that is the institutions, have been uh, categorized into three categories universities, autonomous colleges, and affiliated or constituent colleges. Now, among the affiliated or constituent colleges, again, the program has been distributed in two parts UG and PG. And seven criteria are laid down for all these institutions. Now, if you look at the key indicators, so basically that is the sub criteria associated with a particular criteria. So, altogether, there are 34 key indicators that is the sub criteria associated with the universities, 34 with autonomous colleges, 31 with UG programs of affiliated or constituent colleges, and 32 for PG programs of affiliated or constituent colleges. Now, below criteria, we can see their metrics are mentioned. So, under every criteria, uh, under every indicator, some metrics are provided, and metrics are of two kinds: qualitative and quantitative. So, under qualitative metrics, we have to give a descriptive uh, detail of whatever we are doing under those criteria. We have to provide a qualitative description, and under quantitative metrics, we have to provide numbers. Okay, so the number of students who have undergone particular course or who have got placed or who have uh, got some certificates and so on. So here we have to provide numbers. So we can see that for universities, there are 36 qualitative metrics. For autonomous colleges, there are 35. For affiliated or constituent colleges in UG programs, there are 35. And for PG programs, there are 36 such qualitative metrics. And here you'll see as we go along observing the various criteria that we have to write kind of descriptive uh, explanation of whatever efforts have been made in 500 words, 1000 words, and so on. Under quantitative metrics, there are 79 such metrics for universities, 72 for autonomous colleges, 58 for UG programs in affiliated or constituent colleges, and 60 for PG programs. So, altogether, if you look at the metrics, so 115 for universities, 107 for autonomous colleges, 93 for UG programs in the affiliated and constituent colleges, and 96 for PG programs. So this is the way the whole criteria have been set. And for every criteria, for every key indicator, we have to provide evidences. So whatever you write, let's say you are giving some qualitative description. So you have to provide evidence. Now the evidences could be in the form of geotagged photographs, or they could be in the form of signed documents of the university or the college, isn't it? And they could also include the links of various videos. Okay. Under quantitative metrics, again, we have to provide numbers, but we have to provide the supportive documents. So if you look at the whole thing, the way the seven criteria have been laid down and the way the indicators have been listed and the metrics have been raised, if we start working in those directions, it is very likely that we can take the university or the college or the institution to a living model. Maybe some further additions would be possible, but uh, they are trying to look into every aspect the criteria don't only include the impartment of uh, certain uh, skills in the classrooms, okay, or just uh, prescribing certain things to the students. They talk about all the aspects of uh, human life in some way or the other. Okay, so they will talk about the conduct. They will talk about the uh, skills that are to be developed, the research, and all those things.
Now going further, if you look at the key indicators, so under criterion one, which is the curricular aspects, there are four key indicators. So curriculum design and development is one, curricular planning and implementation is another, then academic flexibility, curriculum enrichment, and then feedback system. So U basically is applicable for universities and autonomous colleges. A is applicable for affiliated or constituent colleges. So here, if you look at 1.3, it is closely related to UHV because when you go for enriching the curricula, then we can include such courses, such value-added courses, short-term courses, which basically enrich the curricula, which are not essentially a mandatory component of the curriculum laid down by the university or college, but they add to the skills, add to the values in the students. Under criterion two, which is the teaching, learning, and evaluation, there are seven key indicators. So student enrollment and profile, catering to student diversity, teaching learning process, teacher profile and quality, evaluation process and reforms, student performance and learning outcomes, and then student satisfaction survey. Now here we see that teaching learning, of course, when it is value-based, all these key indicators will have some contribution of human values, isn't it? But closely, closely related is the uh, indicator 2.3, the teaching learning process, and we'll see how. Then under criterion three, we have research, innovations, and extension. So there are seven key indicators here, promotion of research and facilities, resource mobilization for research, innovation ecosystem, research publications and awards, consultancy, extension activities, collaboration. Now here again, if you look at criterion or the key indicator 3.6, extension activity, there's a lot of scope here to work for uh, inculcating values uh, in the surrounding areas isn't it? Not only among the students, but also in the surrounding areas. So there's a possibility that the colleges can adopt villages, they can adopt Anganwadis, they can uh, uh, also try to be an, be a help to the orphanages or old age homes or uh, such organizations and institutions supporting the deprived section of the society. A lot of possibilities that they can also go and do something for the fulfillment of the nature. Isn't it like planting trees and all those things are possible? So if you look at criterion three here again, like the consultancy or the collaboration can of course be on these lines, but more directly related is criterion 3.6. Now looking at criterion four and five, so not very closely related, somewhat distinctly related, but still uh, we can see that yes, if we start working on the lines of uh, value inculcation. So this will also have some kind of transformation. The physical facilities, library as a learning resource, IT infrastructure, and maintenance of campus infrastructure. This is there under criterion four. Under criterion five, there are key indicators of student support, student progression, student participation and activities, and alumni engagement. So we'll see that if we offer courses in human values, then the alumni engagement is also going to be much better because there is a sense of relationship that gets developed. It has been often found that if the college is not working in this direction, so before leaving the college, the students may also turn somewhat opposed to the colleges. It has been found that in some of the colleges before leaving the institution, the students will spoil the fans of the hostels, toilets of the hostels, just in anger, in rage, because something or the other has uh, been done to them, which is not acceptable to them. So of course, these all indicators will have some transformation when we go about imparting human values, but not very closely related. That's why I have not highlighted this particular uh, criterion. Now, if you look at the criterion six, governance, leadership, and management. So here again, there are five key indicators. First one is uh, institutional well, uh, vision and leadership institutional vision and leadership. The second one is strategy development and deployment. Third one is faculty empowerment strategies. Then financial management and resource mobilization and then internal quality assurance system. So here we see that 6.1 and 6.3 are closely related because when we go to set up any institution, we have to set up a vision. We have to set up mission. We have to 
showcase our leadership and for that uh, a good understanding of inputs in human values is necessary it is rarely found that institutions are able to see that basically they intend to promote value based living among the students this is not clear so if there are faculty in the institution who have done the workshop or there are people like deans directors or people from management who have gone through the workshop then they can try to develop a vision which is completely clear which is completely on the lines of uh, promoting value based living among the students isn't it similarly if you look at the fa faculty empowerment strategies <clears throat> then we'll see that conducting faculty development programs is going to be much of help particularly when we are targeting faculty development programs in human values then criterion 7 is somewhat totally devoted to human values so the first criterion that is the first indicator is institutional values and social responsibility there are 11 sub criteria here the matrix then uh, two best practices have to be listed in 7.2 and then finally you have to uh, share what has been the distinctiveness of the institution in terms of providing good education so something which is distinctive of the institution something which becomes a mark for the institution so here there is a lot of possibility as we go along uh, we can discuss this okay so we we'll see what share of these score uh, can be obtained by working for human values and if this is clear to the management then i think there is a lot of scope for the institution let's say if some institution decides that i have to go for nac 3 years hence then proactively they can start working on these lines and in place of just documenting certain things making documents in the back date and signing them they can really do something on the ground which will be fulfilling to the faculty to the students to the staff and to the society at large quite possible now if you look at the weightages given to the various criteria and the indicators in nac so it is somewhat like this so looking at 1.3.1 it talks about institution how does it integrate cross cutting issues relevant to professional ethics gender human values environment and sustainability into the curriculum so you have to provide the qualitative uh, metrics and you have to provide description in 500 words so the suggested activities here could be like organizing student induction programs as per the nccip guidelines including uhv2 course in the curriculum particularly if you look at uhv2 course aict has made it mandatory uh, for all the institutions and there's a lot of scope to uh, have this course as much effective as possible okay through tutorial courses uh, through tutorials through assignments through interactions and then the institution can also include minor degree course on uhv so the aict has made provision for this and the universities are also coming forward in this direction the university where i am working dr apj abdul kalam technical university in up it has made the provision for including minor degree on uhv and the student has to earn 18 to 20 credits and we have developed around eight courses for the same some courses are under preparation also so this kind of input can be included and they directly relate to professional ethics as well as human values as well as gender equity or sustainability ji ishrat meera ji ji uh, bhaiya actually we also conduct this uh, student workshop uh, in the evening but uh, that will be not of 30 hours no so can we make that also as a value added course for the students certainly uh, that but uh, yeah. but we will not be meeting this 30 hours prerequisite so the certificate is being issued by aict can we add up some more activity at the college level and make it uh, project it as a 30 hour course yeah so first of all like we are doing it on the platform of aict the university or the yes. institution has to take it up then only it can be said that the university has included such value added course okay so okay it's quite possible so what we can do our effort can be an initiation and then the institution can take it up for example in ak gar engineering college of aktu in gaziabad of up uh, the institution has appointed one faculty a friend of ours gopal babu and he has been conducting evening workshop for the students 
since he joined. And every student is asked to uh, be available for the evening workshops by turn. And I think the hours are more than 30 also. So what we can do like in the SIP, students are getting some basic inputs in UHV. In UHV 2, they are getting some descriptive inputs. But to actually be able to understand the values, a lot more interaction is required as we are doing in the morning session or we have been doing in the meetings, weekly meetings. So that opportunity is there. So once they have gone through UHV 2 course, then the evening workshops are conducted and it is made uh, quite interactive. So that is a kind of evaluated course. So here yeah. we are conducting the workshop for the students and like we can just initiate, but then the institution has to take it up seriously. That, that okay. is something to be done. The value education cell can take it up of the institution. Okay. So for this one, we have to take permission from AICT or it will be at the institutional level. We can conduct with a resource person from AICT. See, if you do not want certificate from AICT, the institution can always take it up. Maybe certain courses are there with the institution would like to promote, but they are not on the platform of AICT, for yes. example, yoga or something. So institution can design, take up, and then promote among the students. Okay. If it is has to be from AICT, what is the procedure to apply for this? So basically, we have to take up the proposal to NCCIP, and they have okay. their regular meetings. In that mm -hmm. meeting, the proposal can be discussed okay. and then the various details can be worked out how to certify how to evaluate you know who would be the resource person because then the degree of seriousness would be somewhat different because it is happening on the platform of aict so all these modalities have to be worked out okay okay thank you nice video. so you can see that at point number two we have these validated courses and there are various possibilities here like we can include courses on holistic health Devi Prasanji. So one thing I had to ask you about is just a clarification about the how alumni uh, can be involved in this program. Okay. So if you look at certain sub criteria, they directly relate to the alumni. So for example, when we are offering such courses, the SIP program is there, the regular UHP2 course is there, value added courses are there, electives are there then passing through these courses, the students get associated with you. And then they remain associated, I'll say lifelong. I can remember that there have been students who are associated with me even today, when we interacted in the classroom with these inputs. So alumni can be associated with us, with the faculty, with the institution. And then we can keep on like uh, interacting with them, involving them in the development of the institute. I think presently every IIT, triple IIT, NIT are in inviting their alumni to come back and give back to the institution, to the society. So just giving back in terms of money is not enough. They can come and try to educate their junior batches also. And when we run these programs effectively, then a bond is developed, a relationship is developed with the alumni. So that is very essential. Okay, okay. Nice, nice, sir. So if you look at the courses which can be value added, and let me say that these value added courses do not have to be the part of the curriculum. This is something to be clear about. So they cannot be a part of the curriculum. This is something as an add-on. So we can have inputs in holistic health. We can have yoga classes. We can also have practice exercises in UHV. What we are doing in the morning, such exercises can be done with the students also to some level to which they can understand and explore. Then we can have such courses on sustainable engineering. Like even if you see today, students are doing courses, attending courses on the platform of Swayam or NPTEL, isn't it? So they are doing it by themselves on the online platform, but the institution can come forward to offer these courses in the physical mode. So we can offer courses like the evaluated courses in sustainable engineering, and then also trying to see how coexistence is there, that is to understand the harmony in the nature. Then we can have courses on renewable energy, okay? Uh, so many projects are possible with the students can do, which do not involve much funds. And we keep on getting such videos on WhatsApp or oh, they are available on YouTube also, where a very less educated person from a rural background is able to develop something which is quite useful to the masses. Just recently, I found one video where one student just by welding certain uh, 
L sections of steel has made a vehicle which can uh, carry five people and it is run by a battery and the person claims that the vehicle can go in a single recharge up to 150 kilometers. So such innovations, in fact, there is something called tinkering. We have tinkering studios in the institutions also. So we can offer such inputs in terms of tinkering uh, uh, studio or uh, tinkering exercises where the students can come and try to develop something useful. So that is quite possible. Then we can give uh, the numbers. So criterion, if, the, if you look at number three, 1.3.3.1, .1, so we have to provide the number of students enrolled. So that is basically a quantitative matrix and we have to provide the numbers here. So we can see that if you work for 1.3.2, it supplements 1.3.3 also, okay? So here you have to give some description in point number two. In point number three, you have to give the numbers. So 20 marks for this. Then if you look at 2.3.1, it is student-centric methods such as experiential learning, participative learning, and problem-solving methodologies which are used for enhancing learning experiences. So you have to give a descriptive answer here in 500 words. So one essential conclusion that we are able to fetch from inputs in UHV is that learning, if made explorative, can be much more enhancing, isn't it? If you look at the Bloom's taxonomy also, okay? So the lowest level is remembering in the taxonomy and the highest level is creating. And in between there is valid evaluation, then uh, analysis or comparing such exercises there, analyzing. So if we develop a proposal-based methodology for giving any kind of input, even if somebody is teaching mechanical engineering, okay? So just in place of writing certain things, certain formula on the board, and then asking the students to learn by rote, one can say that I have to design a machine and just tell me what all possibilities are there to develop this kind of machine. And then in due course of time, we can see that students are able to come up with exercises, come up with suggestions, and then we can see that you can refer to this particular input to learn this particular uh, mathematical exercise. And particularly today, if you see the data is so much available and so much of input is there in YouTube, on Google, okay, on uh, learning platforms, that the students are able to get so much of information. What we need essentially and what we are suffering essentially for is the uh, motivation in the students that they do not feel motivated to learn and that's how we have to provide so much of uh, like we have to uh, make them learn through various means so if you look at the bloom's taxonomy the lowest level of learning is remembering and the highest level is creating and in between we have comparing evaluation analyzing isn't it so when the learning is made experiential participative explorational then it becomes richer, isn't it? So if you try to teach other courses also on the line of UHV, then the learning can be much more enjoyable to the students and they can be much more creative there, isn't it? So indirectly, you can always contribute in this parameter by developing a cell verification based methodology. Now, point number five is the ratio of students to mentor for academic and other related issues. So we have to provide the data here, number of mentors and the mentee there. So we already have the mentor and mentee program in SIP. And we have been saying that for every 20 students, there has to be a faculty mentor and a senior student mentor also. So of course, when we do this SIP effectively, then this mentor-mentee program gets initiated and there are eight points allotted for that, isn't it? So if we take it up seriously, then this will not only help us fetch marks in NAC, but also set a kind of tradition in the institution where the senior students are accepting the junior students as their brothers and sisters, helping them solve their problems when they're away from the family. There could be health issues, there could be adolescent issues, there could be academic issues. So this mentorship development programs, uh, these can be made much more effective, isn't it? Then if you look at point number six, the extension activities, so as I mentioned earlier, so the accreditation bodies intend not to make the institutions be focused only for the students within the premises, but they want the institution to participate in the larger order. Okay, and it has always been felt that our students should not be bookish. They should not only go for learning by rote, but they should participate. They should think broadly. They should work for the holistic development of society. So the social issues are available and 
then we can talk about these issues. So when you talk about harmony in the society, the students are able to get a vision for uh, society which is humane, the undivided society. So we can encourage the students to provide help and support in the holistic development of society around. And we can always uh, promote them to work on social causes, social issues. We can have such events in institutions where the students share their thoughts, their views, and they also go outside the premises and participate. So as you were mentioning, so students can go to villages, they can adopt villages. Under UNAT Bhartavyan, already EICT has made it mandatory that every institution has to adopt five villages at least. In UP, the colleges are also being asked to adopt Anganwadis, where small kids are educated, provided education. And then we have orphanages, we have uh, old age homes, we have uh, centers for supporting uh, underprivileged section of the society. So the students can go forward and participate. Let me also say that uh, while studying at IIT Kanpur, we got opportunity to participate in such programs. So there were evening schools being run for the neighboring children from the society, which were not so privileged, particularly for the migrant workers. And in, in one of such programs, only I came across uh, Ganesh Bagadia Ji, where I came across this uh, human values program. And many of my juniors also got associated with these programs with the program of UHB through these kinds of programs. So the students will see who already have some kind of inclination for working for holistic development of society, so some social cause, are already uh, exploring various avenues where they can be of help, they can be uh, contribute, they can be in a position to contribute. So when we extend these activities, then we are able to also get in touch with such students. Okay. And we can develop a pool of such students who already have been thinking on these lines, but they just want some direction. So we can have program for participation for undivided society and universal human order. And this will also get good points for us in NAC. Now, on a similar line is the extension and outreach programs, which are already led down by the government, like NSS or NCC. Then there are some government recognized bodies also, isn't it? So there are 12 points here. Again, such effort which are made informally can have some formal face also. They can be recognized by the government. They can be recognized by the institution. And here again, you can get a good amount of points. And when we work for holistic development of the students, so they naturally get encouraged, enthused to participate in such activities, isn't it? Already institutions have been running programs on NSS, NCC only that we have to give a proper direction. So when we talk about NSS, the students uh, go outside the campus and try to do some socially fulfilling activities. If they are given the right direction, okay, then they can provide right inputs to the society also. And in that process, they also start inculcating such values among themselves. So you can see there's a lot of scope to work for well-being of the students, the faculty, the staff, the society at large, by uh, accepting these criteria under NAC, isn't it? On one hand, the students and the faculty are benefiting. On the other hand, the institution is getting accreditation, okay, acknowledgement from the society, from the government. Next would be like institution has a clearly stated vision. This is under criterion 6. Point, criterion 6. So 6.1.1 says that the institution has a clearly stated vision and mission. So Whenever some institution is uh, started, we have to have a vision. So can the institution have a vision which is value-based, which is going to promote value-based living among the students? So we can, before setting up some vision, we can involve various sections of the institution. We can involve the staff, the faculty, or the management committee, which is going to set up. If the institution is running and trying to update its vision and mission, then of course you can invite all the sections of the institution and then sit together and set up a vision. So while setting up the vision and mission of the institution, we can give a serious thought to it. Even if you look at the companies, how the corporate world is working. So to set up a vision, 
they constitute a committee they invite experts and they have multiple rounds of meetings before setting up a vision so the institution also has to work on those lines so they can sit together discuss and they can invite participants from all the sections of the institution like the grade 4 employee can also be there the students can be there the faculty other staff could be there people from management could be there some experts from outside could be there they can sit together and then think on what line we are going to work further 10 years hence where do we see ourselves 20 years hence 30 years hence how can this institution be a pillar of harmonious society isn't it if that is the motivation in the short run they may not feel very motivated because it may appear that they are not going to gain much in terms of capital or gains monetary gains but in the long run you can see that the even in the industry if you see the industries which have focused on corporate social respons responsibility the industry which have focused on the long term satisfaction of the employee they have been able to move much further so the institutions also can think on those lines and then try to have a vision which is value based coming to point number 9 so it is for effective leadership which is reflected in various institutional practices such as decentralization and participatory management so when you talk about the harmony in the family we talk about parivar sabha isn't it where the family order uh, meetings can be organized so in a similar manner we can have meetings regularly in the institution where uh, from every strata in the institution people can be encouraged to join and we can listen to their concerns their aspirations the problem that they are facing and we can ask them to pose a solution also don't just come with a problem come with a solution and also mention how you are going to contribute in the solution generally it so happens in the institution that there is a divide as we can see a divide between haves and have nots so there is a divide among those who are running the institution and those who are being run isn't it and that divide generally is increasing okay so people have complaints grudges against the management the management has complaints and grudges against the students and faculty and the, that divide keeps on growing and then we have to we can see that there are repressive measures also being adopted in institution to somewhat contain that divide now if we have meetings where we can share our concerns our aspirations we can sit together to develop a solution we can also share how we can contribute to implement that solution so that kind of approach can be adopted and this can be a culture in the in the institution that in place of complaining about the problem talk about the solution in fact what we say you no know, generally in the workshop also that there could be two approaches one is the problem centric and the other is solution centric generally people are used to having a problem centric approach they pick a problem complain about it and hold the other responsible for the problem in place of that we can pick any problem suggest a solution and then ask everyone how you can contribute to the solution so the whole atmosphere the whole environment the ecosystem of the institution can get transformed by this ji then point number 10 is the average percentage of teachers undergoing fdps so that can include the professional development programs orientation programs induction programs refresher courses short term courses so we can have faculty development programs in uhv we can also have induction program for faculty as we have for students for the institution where i am working so whenever a new faculty is recruited we make a program that let every faculty go through the workshop first so that they are able to be acquainted to the culture of the institution how we are going to move forward how uh, they are going to participate is it that they will be on the receiving end and we are going to dictate or we are going to participate together so the induction program is necessary for the faculty also in fact this can be conceived this can be proposed also and i think some initiative has been taken by iict also you see might also be thinking on those lines so that kind of possibility is there then we can have short term courses for faculty in uhv in fact it has been thought that the minor degree course which is being offered for the students minor degree can also be offered for faculty in fact the students are little under pressure for placement and that's how they are going for internship more and more internship more and more online courses so they do not have so much of time but the faculty they are asked by the management to undergo courses online in fact in some institutions i have heard that the faculty has to at least attend one mooc course in a semester 
and then there could be also some incentives based on that so if the minor degree is offered to the faculty also and we are considering that maybe in the next nccip meeting we are going to propose that also so if this faculty go through such courses then they can develop themselves much faster and gradually we can have the uh, well education cell coordinators or the university coordinators or the regional coordinators who have gone through all these courses so we have a different kind of ecosystem in the entire country so that kind of possibility is there bhaiya you have told about that induction program for faculty no bhaiya ji uh, for for newly joined faculties so that could be possible uh, the, in all the colleges bhaiya but uh, uh, shall we conduct uh, once bhaiya that is uh, in the in the odd semester um, most probably uh, many faculties will be joining in the odd semester only bhaiya new faculty yeah. so we can whether we can conduct uh, one day faculty program bhaiya for the new faculty like that we can plan bhaiya uh, that would not be very effective really. in fact you can ask them to undergo this five day online ftp yes sir, bhaiya that ACP. that we are doing bhaiya that we are doing i thought uh, you are asking us to refresh uh, or to say uh, what, what is the uh, sir, what, what is the scenario and what are the programs uh, so that we have to say orally or through circular bhaiya yeah that can be mandated by the institution that for every new oh, entrant as a faculty yes yes uh, that can uh, be a mandate that you have to go through this fdp okay okay bhaiya ji yeah. so they will be acquainted with the culture and civilization inside the institution yes bhaiya clear bhaiya clear bhaiya yeah. and uh, what about this uh, short term courses bhaiya short term courses the minor degree be, uh, yeah like short term courses can also be developed as you were talking about the students we can run such courses for faculty also and the short term courses will merge with minor degree because uh, mm. it is somewhat at a self paced level so okay. they can go through these courses and then they can benefit from that ji bhai like the nptel course uhv3 yes, we are yes. doing no the similar yes. manner bhai yeah yes. so presently so this that... uhv3 ji aict has been offering but uh, the credits are not there but gradually we are uh, working uh, on those lines so that it can be credited also yes bhai yes bhai ji 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 bhai thank you bhai nice didi now looking at point number 11 so from here we are talking about criterion 7 which is completely devoted to uhv so how to promote gender equity so in uhv we have been talking about respect respect is right evaluation and then we say that once we are able to rightly evaluate oneself and the other then there is no differentiation and this gender differentiation is because we are looking at ourselves or the other as a body isn't it so the counseling could be done with the students through the content of uhv so they get acquainted with the right meaning of respect they are not now uh, misguided in terms of infatuation basically they are able to understand the meaning of love so this kind of input can be given and when the mutual respect is there then the uh, issues that we see in the society today also get curtailed then we can arrange weekly sessions for uhv for faculty and staff members also so that they are able to promote such kind of programs in institution and then there could be efforts to remove differentiation there are five points are located for this now point number 12 it's uh, about the energy so the institution has facilities for alternate sources of energy and energy conservation measures so there are options like solar energy biogas plant willing to the grid sensor based energy conservation and use of led bulbs or power efficient equipment so here we can have efforts for using renewable energy as much as possible we can promote uh uh like willing to the grid willing to the grid essentially means that if you are able to produce so much of power from solar panel then we can also supply power back to the grid from where we have been drawing power and the students can be encouraged for projects in this direction isn't it uh like generally we are throwing away the uh waste from the institution but if we can have a biogas plant so we can see how the waste can be reused or utilized in this manner so there is a lot of scope in fact projects can be floated in this direction isn't it 
now next point is about the waste management so we can have solid waste we can have liquid waste biomedical waste e waste and then we can have waste recycling system we can also have uh, waste which is hazardous and which is radioactive so here again when we are clear about the harmony in the nature we are able to see the interrelationship between the four orders of nature so we can encourage such practices in institution so that the waste is reduced the waste is recycled and also reused to whatever extent possible isn't it so that can be a kind of culture in the institution how to reduce the waste this is also somewhat being focused upon but not to that extent but that kind of scope is there recycling is very less nowadays so this recycling can be encouraged in the colonies we can see that some kind of plants are being set which are meant for recycling of waste in fact if not done then sooner or later we are going to have a kind of menace in the society where we have mounds of waste in delhi and cr there are two big mounds and that has also become a political issue now the election that is being fought now uh, one of the agenda is also how to reduce this kind of waste so a culture has to set in the institution not to pollute the nature not to uh, dispose of so much of waste to the nature isn't it then next point is about water conservation so we can have facilities for rain water harvesting we can have bore wells and open well recharge we can construct tanks and bunds we can also go for recycling of waste water and we can maintain water bodies also and the distribution systems can be set in the campus so here again the efforts for preservation of the rest of nature which can lead to value based living and we can also have a harmonious living with the rest of nature so we can make efforts in terms of enriching the nature protecting the nature and rightly utilize the nature and the students can be encouraged to come up with new ideas design new systems new technologies so that we can have good use of the water in fact uh, gradually if you see the metro cities are having scarcity of water so of the metro cities in our country also have been declared not to have ground water isn't it and that has become a challenge and gradually the number of such cities is on the rise and generally we have good college in these cities only so we can think that why when the institutions are cropping up in large numbers in such metro cities why these problems are still continuing why can't we solve our own problems why should somebody from outside and solve our problems isn't it so when we have a concern for the nature when we are able to see the relations with the nature so we can of course naturally start working in this direction then uh, there are some green campus initiatives also so how to make the campus green so how to promote the use of cycles okay in fact we can also encourage the students and the faculty to come to the institution on cycles if their uh, residence is near if the hostel is near we can make a rule that in the campus only battery powered vehicles will be allowed in fact there are some companies also which do not allow ic engine Uh, powered vehicles inside the campus because pollution is there so some initiatives have been taken in fact we can have some session with the students where we can uh, webcast such uh, videos to the students and they can be encouraged to think on these lines walking can be encouraged okay so we can make uh, we can make pedestrian friendly pathways also presently the government has also been taking up initiative so that the students are able to walk at least for 10000 steps every day isn't it we can ban the use of plastic at least the single use plastic and the students can be encouraged to go for plantation within the institution outside the institution so that the landscaping can be done then here again the relations with the nature the understanding of it is going to be much of help then we can go for quality audits on environment energy already there are so many audits in place green audit energy audit environmental audit clean and green campus institution or recognition or awards are there and then the beyond the campus environmental promotional activities are also there so here again like green audit means how much of green tree is there <clears throat> we can audit it we can also audit how much energy we are consuming and how much we are producing how much we are polluting or enriching the environment outside okay and have we been taking initiatives for clean and green campus standing of harmony in the nature taking such initiatives comes naturally otherwise we have to 
force everybody for such initiatives or at least these things get done on the paper and not much interest is shown by any section of the institution. Then uh, describing the institutional efforts and initiatives in providing an inclusive environment that is tolerance and harmony. So for this, uh, we can encourage activities. We always uh, like if we have the mandatory course in the second year, we have the SIP. So some initiative is already there in place. In addition to that, we can uh, act, promote such activities which uh, encourage harmonious relation in the institution between the management and faculty, among the faculty. You can see so much of time and energy is wasted when we have disharmony, when we have uh, bitterness in the relationship among the faculty, isn't it? So some initiatives can be taken on these lines. And then while promoting harmony towards cultural, regional, linguistic, communal, socioeconomic diversities, then we can have such cultural activities also. We can develop this kind of culture and civilization. Then sensitizing the students and employees of the institution to the constitutional obligations like values, rights, duties. Here again, talking about justice among the human beings, and then having a kind of culture where we focus on relationship. Okay. We do not undermine the relationship, but we focus on relationship, we talk about relationship. We have sessions where we talk about relationships. So those kinds of initiatives, of course, will help us in this direction. Then prescribing a code of conduct. So in place of just prescribing a code of conduct, we can have a participative way of developing such conduct. So how to ensure respect, mutual respect among the employees, among the students, okay, among the uh, administrators. So we can uh, take some proactive steps in this direction. So that just in place of putting something on the website in, um, in the name of code of conduct, we can have a good harmonious okay, uh, atmosphere in the institution. So this is all about 7.1. 7.1.11 is also there, but it is about celebrations, the festivals and all. So I've not included it because it is not very directly related. But of course, these celebrations also contribute to the harmony in the institution. Now the 20th point is about 7.2. So that is about two best practices. So this is up to the institution, how it counts its best practice, isn't it? So if you are able to take up these activities at a very serious level, then uh, we can have uh, such best practices. For example, this participative management, isn't it? Could be a very good practice. Uh, working in the direction of value-based living could be a very good practice, okay? Reducing waste could be a very good practice. When we are talking about innovation, incubation, entrepreneurship, so how to base all these things on relationship, how to base management on relationship, this could be a very good practice. So we can think of these lines again, and the extension activities can also come here, isn't it? Now, the last one is portraying the performance of the institution in one area distinctive to, the, to its priority and thrust. So here you have to describe in thousand words. So here, if we are able to give proper emphasis on UHV, then this can be one distinctive area. So for Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Technical University, where I am working, we have portrayed the promotional activities for UHV in the last 13 years as the distinctive feature of the university, because we can see that this initiative was taken by this university much uh, earlier, and it has come to fruition also on various counts. So this is just one example, but as more and more institutions are going forward in this direction, so we can look for certain other distinctive activities under the umbrella of UHV, okay, which can portray the performance of the institution in that particular area. So we can see uh, out of 1,000 marks, somewhat you know, 178 marks are related directly or indirectly to UHV. And if you work on these lines, so the rest of the criteria also get affected by this. Now, what could be some of the possible mentions in the SSR, the self-study report? So something that we have mentioned in our SSR, I'm listing them here. So the university has been running the induction program regularly for all the new entrants in the first year, which has modules of UHV as well as Indian knowledge system, which lays stress on the values of tolerance, harmony towards cultural, regional, linguistic, communal, socioeconomic, and other diversities. So this has been there in place. 
the university has been running a course on UHV. Earlier, it was an audit course, then it was made a credit course. And we have been making effort to make it more and more effective by having more and more FDPs here for the faculty. Then the university has been conducting development programs for all the faculty, staff, and students. So why to keep the staff and students untouched? Okay, so why not include them also? So AKTU uh, started PDP uh, for the staff also. This year, we were mandated to have four PDPs, professional development program for the staff. And there we included UHV as an essential component. So this also has been a good initiative. Now, in addition, the university has been offering electives in third and fourth year, like understanding human being, nature and existence comprehensively, which is UHV 3, vision for humane society, which is UHV 4. And then in UHV 5, we have multiple electives like human values in Sankh, Yoga and Vedant Darshan, human values in Bodh and Jain Darshan, in Madhyas Darshan. And we are also in the process of developing courses in uh, UHV in or human values in uh, Christianity or Islam or other schools of thought, isn't it? Other religions. Now, what would be the expected outcome out of all these efforts? So I have tried to list some of them. Basically, at the end of every course, we float a feedback form among the students, even at the end of SIP. I hope we have taken some feedback from the students after SIP also. And through the course that we have been offering, this kind of feedback has come very regularly. So I'm just listing them here. So as a result of the UHB course, the students have a better understanding of physical facilities. They get a good understanding of prosperity. In fact, the students who come to the campus and they feel somewhat subdued or feel low because they come from a humble background, they get a good amount of confidence that they are able to understand the meaning of prosperity. Prosperity is not about possession of wealth. It is about the understanding of the needs, basically, for physical facilities and fulfilling the needs. Then their understanding of the purpose of education is better. They are able to see that education is not only meant for job placement package, but rather it has a much deeper cause. And then they feel self-motivated to attend classes, isn't it? They become more attentive in the class. They feel more related to the faculty who has been offering inputs in UHV. As a result of the course, the students are clearer of the meaning of happiness. In fact, they are able to see that whatever efforts that they are uh, doing today, the basic purpose is to be happy and that also in continuity. In fact, some students have come to me and told me that one thing that they could learn very clearly in UHV is that basically they are aspiring for happiness. And this keeps on haunting them, you know, the, whether I'm getting happier or not through my efforts. <laughs> so this kind of feedback is always to be seen. Then they are able to see values can be practiced by every individual. It's not something which is bookish, which is just a moral uh, learning, but this is something livable. One can be prosperous, one can be happy, one can have fulfilling relationship in the family. Particularly when we have inputs in uh, relationship, then it becomes much more relevant to the students and students feel much more interested. Then they are able to see that the unhappiness is more due to lack of fulfilling relationship and not due to lack of physical facility. This becomes very much clear to them. I'll say that this is one of the strongest takeaway from the courses in UHV that they are able to focus more on relationship in place of money. Then there are negative emotions like doubting intention of the other, anger, greed, frustration, jealousy, irritation, all these get reduced as they have been saying. This is something that I have got from the students. I'm not mentioning from my side. Then the course has made the students more responsible towards health. This is also quite visible. In fact, whenever some students fall sick, I do ask them that is it due to uh, wrong intake or is it due to something else and a possible a more probable cause is that they took something on the thela or kulcha and they felt sick okay. so they are able to see that yes they have to become responsible towards health and for that proper intake proper upkeep of the body is required then they are able to see that the contents of the course are appropriate for university students it's not something which uh, cannot be taught to the students Earlier, the students have a feeling that such things cannot be taught, but gradually they are able to see that this is something which can form an essential input in education. And earlier they were they are in the hands of their parents, being fondled by their parents, but now they have to take every decision on their own. They have to discipline their life. So they become more and more self-disciplined. In fact, some of the bad habits like taking drugs or alcohol or something, uh, that also get 
gets reduced. Though they do not say this clearly by themselves, but the students, their friends are able to say that this person has improved a lot and in terms of all these things. Then that also helps them transition from school to the university. It also has been transformational in terms of starting a process of self-exploration. In place of learning by road, depending on some foreign information, okay, or drawing inspiration from here and there, they are able to explore by themselves. They become much more mature. This is something that parents also have been telling. They may not do so well in academics maybe, but they now become more and more explorative. Okay, because they are able to see that essentially this is something that is going to take them to the state of happiness. Okay, not essentially marks or money. So that is a very essential takeaway. The course helped them in understanding relationships and they are able to feel committed to try to develop better inside the family, outside the family with friends and teachers. And they also become willing to work for socially useful projects and mentoring their junior students. So let me say that one course that I'm teaching, the students have decided, I don't know how much they are going to be successful at this juncture because they are in bachelor's level, but they have thought of making a project for developing a chatbot for FAQs of UHB. So in the next two weeks, we are going to have presentation. So they are able to think on those lines. I asked them to come up with some idea and then they said that uh, UHB has been very much transformational for them. And they together will come up with a good uh, kind of project, which can also be some kind of app. I am not sure how much uh, <laughs> successful this is going to be because I will not commit much here, but at least they are able to think in those lines, on those lines, isn't it? And also mentoring their junior students. So this was all from my side as an input. Now I'm open to reflection and questions. Ji. Yeah, I, I listened to this presentation. It was basically focused towards NAC. But when I'm working on the NBA panel at most of the time, I think similar such presentation uh, taking into account the human values to be taken focused more on the accreditation of NBA visit is very much called for sir. So if you intend to provide some such presentation next time, it would be highly desirable. Sure, sir. We can think on those lines. Basically, since I had been working for developing uh, doc, uh, making some documents for NAC, so I came across all these criteria and then we thought that why not go ahead and have a kind of discussion over these criteria. Uh, so if, uh, we can also make some program for NAC, uh, NBA also. I am mm -hmm. presently not exposed to the criteria of NBA, but I have uh, come to know that the criteria are almost similar. So we can okay. make something like this for NBA also, it's quite possible. Very good. very good, sir. I'll be very happy to attend to that program so seriously. I will be very much interested in joining that. Nice, okay. nice, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ji, Supraja ji, you have a mic. Oh. Kumar uh, Paya, as you mentioned, we would like to take it to this course, to the minor degree program, as well as UHV2 program to the uh, students. Uh, but we need to train the faculties more. In that case, uh, we don't have the regular UHV2's workshop happening right now. Can we conduct any in-house programs by calling the resource person through ICT programs, which is possible? Yes, Didi. In fact, we do have to run UHB2 uh, workshop online and it is also being planned now that the leadership of AICT has changed. So we are in a kind of waiting mode to see uh, what decisions are taken. But we can also have always have a self-sponsored face-to-face workshop in the institution. This has already been planned. This is uh, one of the... Our institution is ready for self-sponsored programs, but the resource person has to be come from AICT, right? G. So what you can do, you can get in touch with the university coordinator or the regional coordinator. If you are the university coordinator, then you can get in touch with the regional coordinator so that okay, you can make that uh, calendar. We are planning okay. to have such workshops in the winter season. So maybe that can great be included. Your institution can be included. Great, Baya. Great, Baya. And for the minor degree program, what could be the qualification for teachers? Is the UHV2 is enough for them to take up all the courses or... Should the faculty to be trained in the uh, extracurricular like uh, health perspective, all the levels should they get trained? And in that way, where can they find those courses? Yeah. So for minor degree, what we thought that for UHV2, up to UHV2, we have been conducting online and 
offline workshops now for further courses like we, uh, this course in holistic human health is there as mm -hmm. one of the minor degree courses so so mm -hmm. for that we can have the mooc courses the swam platform can be used okay bhaiya okay Abhi, bhaiya ji so for which uh, three we already have the course in place अवेलेबल नाउ वंस द माइनर डिग्री uh gets accepted on swam totally so all these courses will be uploaded on swam platform also oh uh, ji uh, this to faculty has to take the minor degree program before they it is being given to the students am i right by or all students directly can take this program in the swam platform so what we are suggesting is that uh like even in the self paced mode even if it is not there on swam so mm -hmm. the videos have been uploaded on vhb.org.in the faculty yeah, can get uh, uh, and we can have uh, certain regular interaction with the faculty to mm -hmm. develop the faculty on those lines so probably like for the batches which are inducted this year so from next year they will be undergoing uh, like next year they will be undergoing vhv2 and then in the third year they will be taking up vhv3 and 4 so before that okay. we are thinking of developing the faculty to uh, like either swam or in a self paced mode by organizing some interactive sessions ji bhai ji bhai thank you bhai nice didi rajin prasad ji ji good evening sir ji good evening b b thinks that uh, every college have a own uhb garden nearby playground nearby uh, and admission block ya in nearby uh, hostel to so such a uhb garden uh, reflect the uh, student and then uh, faculty in all department to think not clear bhaiya uh, you are saying uhb garden it has been name of the uhb garden developed in a, every um, college okay so we can just call it a garden <laughs> no need no need to tag it as uhv but yes we can always try to enrich the nature so we can make such uh -huh. gardens and in fact let me mention one thing that while working at uh, like while we were studying at itk so we made some effort to have vegetable production in the hostels and include the staff as well as the students for the production and that came out very successfully yes. so we can have such efforts in the hostels of other colleges also in fact in ekegar college uh, our uh, resource person gopal babu is trying to uh, develop some practices where the students get involved in production activities vegetables mm -hmm. or some day to day products like soap and other things so such promotional activities can be of course starting the institutions ji thanks that one nice bhaiya rangnath ji yes <laughs> sir good evening sir ji good evening sir uh, i have small submission sir if you permit me i put forward sir ji ji yeah sir uh, it would be better uh, for us if you keep uh, your um, presentation sir lent on content max sir in uh, sir whatsapp or group or uh, in a form of uh, getting it sir yes sir you know, the uh, whole presentation and the recording would be available on youtube so that yes. is going to be there very soon yeah yes, yes, yes. so that uh, we can adopt it sir uh, we can say sir uh, do they take uh, <coughs> so we have combination uh, subjects sir for second years uh, professional ethics plus uh, human values sir Yes. Do NAC people consider it as a UHV sir? Yeah. So the SIP as well as the UHV two course to yes. be taught in the second year. 
Yes, they are sir, of course yes. a part of the curriculum essentially, and yes, they are sir, yes. acknowledged and recognized by NAC also. Uh, yeah, it is credit course, sir, in second year B Tech programs. Sir. Gee, gee, it is there. Yeah, okay. credit course, three credit course. Uh, in fact, we are thankful to AICT that earlier the number of credits for B Tech was only one sixty, but to include this particular course, they extended it to one sixty three, so that this becomes mandatory. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are grateful to AICT, grateful uh, to people like you, sir, because this is wonderful, very amazing, sir. Uh, so far, we have been uh, concentrating on our results, our infrastructure and development, other things. The first time now listening to EHV content for NAC program. Really, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Nice, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. G. So, Didi, this was all from my side. Yeah, time is also getting up, so yeah, maybe yeah. you can take up. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kumar Sambhav for the wonderful session.